So next, I want to do the arbitrage pricing theory. This comes next because it's a fundamentally different logic, a fundamentally different approach to getting to the same end, which is a factor pricing model. So the goal, the arbitrage pricing theory has the same goal. Uh, let's run a return of, reg uh, run a regression of a return on two factors in this case. And to make life simple, this will be an excess return, and the factors will also be excess returns on large portfolios. So the Fahman French model would be an instance of this kind of regression, where the market excess return, the value minus growth return, and the small minus big return would be the factors on the right-hand side. If we take the average value of such a regression, we get expected return is beta times expected factor 1, beta 2 times expected factor 2. Uh, we would normally get an alpha there, but our goal is to find some logic that the alpha should be 0. And if the alpha is 0, then the expected return is higher where the betas are higher with the, lamp, with the expected values of the factors, the slope coefficients. So again, that's just a factor model. Our goal is derive a factor model. Our goal is find some logic that that alpha should be 0, but we're going to try it from a different way. We're not going to go from the consumption-based model. The, the idea of the APT is that if these residuals are small, then the alphas should be small. We're not going to prove alpha 0, but we're going, to, we're going to find some logic under which the alphas will be small without using utility functions, consumption growth, or anything else. Here we go. Start with this regression. So run your regression of the return on the factors, just like Fama French's table 1 regression. And then let's form a portfolio that is our left-hand return minus the beta times the factors. Stop and take a deep breath. This is something apparently simple, but very deep and very beautiful. What you've done here is used the regression coefficients on the factors as weights in a portfolio. Well, the factors are traded, so you're perfectly well allowed to do that. The same symbols now mean something completely different. Here they meant regression coefficients. Here you're going to form a for portfolio long your test asset and short the factor portfolios using the regression coefficients as weights. That is one of the most useful things you can learn anywhere in finance. What we've created is a hedge portfolio. This portfolio has, uh, has a minimum variance property, right? Because the errors have a minimum variance property. It's the optimal hedge portfolio. If you want to hold that thing and short out some portfolios that minimize variance, that optimally hedge the risks of that portfolio, a regression tells you exactly how to do that. Furthermore, it's a way of saying, suppose I want to invest in this thing and I believe it has some alpha, how can I hold just the alpha? If I, if I hold the asset itself, I hold the alpha, but I also hold these factor risks. Well, use that portfolio construction to short out the factor risks and get yourself just the alpha. It's also called uh, portable alpha in the industry. It's a way of uh, taking the alpha profits of a strategy and getting them pure in purest possible form without also having the, the uh, factor risks, which you can get for free. So having done that, having formed the optimal hedge portfolio, having formed the, the portable alpha portfolio, what do we have? The rate of return on your portfolio, the mean return on the portfolio is alpha. The standard deviation of the portfolio return is, uh, is, is the standard deviation of the epsilon. So the sharp ratio of the portfolio is alpha over sigma of epsilon. A natural thing to do if you're thinking of, explo of exploiting this opportunity and shorting out the factor risks. Well, now let's make an assumption. How big of a sharp ratio can really last in markets? Yes, this is a little bit of a utility assumption. Um, the sharp ratio on the market's about a half. A sharp ratio of one or two, will that, really be, will that really survive? Or will traders come in, bid up the prices, and get rid of expected returns? So the assumption that we'll make in the APT is that there's an upper bound for sharp ratios. Sharp ratios beyond some certain upper bound just don't survive, uh, and those expected returns will be driven down again. Well, if that's true, if the sharp ratios are bounded by something, then small errors must mean small alphas. 
This is usually stated in more formal ways. Uh, it's stated as a limit. If the sharp ratio is less than some upper bound, then as the errors go to zero, the alphas must go to zero. Or if you'd like to be even more formal, but actually meaningfully formal, if you can, for any error less than a certain delta, that tells you an upper bound on, on what the alphas can be. So the pr prediction of the, uh, of the APT is that alphas should be small where the R squareds are large. If you can find um, factors that explain a lot of the return on, the, uh, uh, on, on your test assets, then in those cases, the errors are small, uh, the R squareds are large, and the alphas should be small numbers. A different way of getting to a factor pricing model.